Hello everyone and welcome to this new video about level design. In this episode, we're going to do a little follow-up on another video I made previously in this series about the problem of feature creep. In this episode, I discussed how, as creators, we're always trying to show more and more content, sometimes up to a point where it's detrimental to the final result. We like to add different types of platforms and collectibles and enemies, and we like to put in all of the actions our hero can perform in every level to show our players that the game is not just an empty shell and that it offers plenty of features. The issue is that in doing so, we often lose the internal consistency of the level, we drown the players in new patterns and learnings, and we hardly encourage mastery. Today, I want to continue on this idea and see how this trick of keeping your designer's palette small to better convey your content can be applied to lots of things other than features. Another obvious topic that can benefit from this well-measured selection is the actual environment assets in your level, the ones that don't impact the gameplay directly but form the background and the atmosphere. It looks pretty clear that if I try and mash together a castle and a golf court, even if everything has a so-called low-poly style, the result will be very strange. It can be a design choice, don't get me wrong, but this would only work in a very particular kind of game. Most of the time, it will seem like you tried, but failed, to use various asset kits to populate your game quickly. Similarly, mixing visual styles is rarely easy. If I create a platformer by mixing together a scribble style with a flat style and then a 1-bit pixel art style, I'll again get a fairly weird output. It could be really great if your game is about parallel worlds, or the total transformation of the space around you, or even just an established chaotic universe, a la Lovecraft. But you should be very cautious with this sort of visual mixing, especially as a beginner, because it can drive you, of course, the same way feature creep will hinder level consistency. Even if you stick to a single visual style and a limited number of elements, it can also be nice to check the colors are well chosen. Although the first games and the pixel art vibe have made flashy and colorful visuals a known and acceptable type of render for video games, the modern AAA productions now try to reproduce reality as well as possible, along with its less saturated tones. And many smaller or even indie games that have been deemed great on the graphics side were brilliant partly because of their limited palette of colors. In that regard, sounds are another crucial topic. Since games are multimedia artworks, you usually have to create musics and sounds that go well with the images you show the player, as well as working together. So basically, they need both internal consistency and contextual consistency. Putting laser shot sounds when an archer fires an arrow in your medieval fantasy game will, once again, look like a discrepancy or even an error in most cases. And having jazz music in the middle of a spaceship race would be a strong aesthetic choice that some players might have trouble accepting. The same could go for animations or physics. For example, nobody would expect ragdoll movements in a high-fidelity, hyper-realistic arena FPS. You would probably also want the narration to have a specific tone, the dialogues to be written in a certain way, and the characters to have clear behaviors. Gameplay mechanics should follow the story and the universe logically, and the overall pacing should fit the type of game you advertised. There are probably plenty of other design points where this rule could apply, so feel free to tell me in the comments if you feel I forgot an important one. However, all this is not to say that you should stay imprisoned of the common stereotypes and clichés. Creation for video games is all about understanding the fundamentals and the player's expectations to exceed them and surprise the audience in a clever way. But as usual, keep in mind that you should probably not change everything at once, or too often. Take your time and choose Sculptorias to demonstrate your originality, so that your game is unique but also contains some common things to help with immersion. Anyway, that's it for today. I hope you enjoyed this quick tips and techniques tutorial about level design and that you've now got a better idea of what it means to keep your palette small as a designer. 
If you did, feel free to like the video and subscribe to the channel. And of course, don't hesitate to leave a comment with your own ideas for future level design tutorials. As always, thanks a lot for watching and take care.